Alright folks, with our last video we were just talking about ammonia. We had re redrawn its Lewis structure and we were going to discuss uh, possible shapes, uh, bond angle, and, uh, and polarity. So let's take a look here. The way we do this is we look at the center atom and we have some questions that I want to ask and let's see, they're down here on this next page. I think they're on the same page for your notes. You might have to flip it over. I can't recall how it looks inside your manual. But let's take a look at our Lewis structure and see if we can answer these questions. How many pairs of electrons are around the center atom? We always focus on the center atom here. And there's one, two, three, four pairs altogether. What's the geometry for four pairs? Do you remember? I don't care if they're bonding. I just want you to focus on the four pairs so that they're as far away from each other as possible. Aren't those four pairs going to form a tetrahedron or have what we call a tetrahedral shape? Now, how many of those pairs are bonding pairs? Well, there's one, two, three are bonding. And how many are non-bonding? By the way, another term for non-bonding is lone pair. And we have one lone pair or one non-bonding pair. Now, what would the shape be? Well, we have four pairs and three are bonding. So one would have that type of shape. Four pairs, one, two, three, four and three of those pairs are bonding. So this non-bonding pair is going to influence these bonding pairs. It's going to push it down into this shape here. And that shape is called a trigonal pyramid. Okay, that shape is called a trigonal pyramid. It is not trigonal planar. These guys are not flat. You can see they're, they're popped up into this pyramidal shape. Now, What's the bond angle? Well, remember, for a tetrahedron, tetrahedron, didn't we expect that bond angle to be 109.5? And sure enough, that's what we might expect the bond angle between hydrogen, nitrogen, and hydrogen in the ammonia molecule. But, I need to teach you something new. Lone pairs, or non-bonding pairs, take up more space than these bonding pairs here. The reason for that is this lone pair is not being shared between two positive nuclei. See, there's a hydrogen nucleus here and a nitrogen nucleus in the middle there, and they're both pulling on that pair of electrons right here. It's pulling on it and thinning out that cloud a little bit. This lone pair does not have that happening. It's bonded to the central nitrogen, but there's no other positive nucleus up here battling for that pair. So it's puffier, it's bigger. And as a result, it reduces the bond angle, because it's bigger, by about 2 degrees. It's actually a bit more than 2 degrees. So, instead of 109.5, the angle is actually closer to 107 degrees. Every time there's a non-bonding pair of electrons, we reduce, we reduce that bond angle by a bit more than 2 degrees. So, two non-bonding pairs would reduce it to about, by about 5 degrees. Okay? Now, let's think about polarity. And we're going to use our little spaceship analogy. Remember, we have a spaceship here, here, and here, and there's not one back here this time. They're going to be pulling on that asteroid in the middle. Won't that have a net dipole and move in that direction off the paper? You bet. So if it moves, it's considered to be polar, and ammonia truly is a polar molecule. So I like to pretend the dipoles are acting like tiny spaceships, pulling or pushing on the central atom. Will it move? If you decide that central atom moves, then we say it's polar, because the dipoles do not cancel each other completely. If it doesn't, then it's nonpolar. So now you know why that spaceship picture has been in your notes all year. All right, next up, let's draw the Lewis structure for water again. Okay, so water, H2O. We've drawn it several times, haven't we? There's oxygen bonded to two hydrogens, a lone pair above and below the oxygen atom. So when you look at this Lewis structure, you're saying to yourself, geez, Hummer, that's linear. Those atoms are right in line with each other. Let's not jump to conclusions too quickly. Let's think about this a little bit. How many pairs of electrons are around the center atom? So the center atom's oxygen, and there's four pairs around there again. What's the geometry of four pairs? Do you remember? Whether they're bonding or not, 
four pairs are going to form a tetrahedral shape, aren't they? So the geometry of just the pairs is called tetrahedral. We call that electronic geometry. We don't care what's bonded to them quite yet. We just care about those pairs. Now, how many pairs are bonding? Well, we have one, two. Two pairs are bonding. How many are non-bonding? One, two. Two are non-bonding. Well, let's go ahead and build that. So we'll put a bond up here, and then we'll put a bond over here, and take a look. Is that a linear shape? Absolutely not. That is a bent molecule. It's a bent molecule. It's not linear. See, these two non-bonding pairs are influencing these two bonding pairs. They're pushing them away. They're causing it to be bent. So even though the Lewis structure looks linear, you have to envision this model in your mind's eye when you look at the water molecule's Lewis structure. So what's the bond angle? Well, once again, if we have four pairs, you might suspect it's 109.5 degrees. And you're pretty close if you would suspect that. But remember, non-bonding pairs take up a bit more space than bonding pairs. A bit more, they reduce this angle by a bit more than two degrees for each one. So if we have two non-bonding uh, pairs, it reduces the bond angle by more than four degrees. So instead of 109.5, that angle is actually closer to 105 degrees for the water molecule. Use your spaceship analogy. Isn't that gonna move? Yep, there's nothing back here to pull against it. We only have these two pulling in that direction. So that molecule is polar. Okay. All right, let's draw the Lewis structure for oxygen gas. We have two oxygen atoms. Each has six valence for a total of 12. So we're going to do this the long way. We'll put one pair between them. That's how we like to start. Hopefully there's just a single bond. I guess not hopefully. It doesn't make a difference to us, does it? But we always like to try the simplest first. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. That doesn't work. So remember, if a single pair being shared doesn't work, we have to try two pairs. And then we'll put a pair above and a pair below this oxygen to complete its octet. And the same with the oxygen on the other side. So there's our Lewis structure. Now there's only two atoms, so what does this shape have to be? Yeah, it can't be anything else but linear. Two atoms are always linear. And the polarity? Well, is there a difference in the electronegativities? No, they're the same. So they share those two pairs perfectly even. So there's no dipole this time. So the oxygen molecule we would call nonpolar. Let's try carbon dioxide, CO2. So carbon has four valence. Each oxygen has six valence. So we have 12 plus four, 16 valence electrons to work with here. Put carbon in the center and we'll try our single bonds, okay? We'll finish this oxygen's octet by adding three more pair. Finish this carbon by adding a pair above and a pair below, and this oxygen by adding three more pair. Let's see if this works. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Rats, we're only allowed 16, so that's a no-go. Well, let's try this guy, where we have one uh, double bond on this side and a single bond in the other. Let's see if that works. This oxygen only needs two more pair now. That carbon needs one more pair to complete its octet, and this oxygen needs three more pair. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Rats, we're only allowed 16. That doesn't work. So if a double and a single bond doesn't work, what are we gonna do? Well, let's try this. Let's put a double bond on this side and a double bond on the other side. Does that carbon need any more to complete its octet? Let's see. Two, four, six, eight. Nope, it doesn't. This oxygen, though, needs two more pair. I put one above and one below. And this oxygen needs two, two more pair, one above and one below. So we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. That is it. Now, what are we going to do for the shape of this guy? That's sort of interesting here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get two oxygens. We're going to say that these reds are oxygens, okay? And we are going to change out these uh, shorter sticks for some that are bit longer. So we're going to say that's my carbon in the center. Okay. And we will have four pairs around it. Right. One, two, three, four. So one pair there. Another pair there. That's getting me on my way. Let's 
see if I can find two more of those longer ones. They're a bit more flexible, you'll see. One there, and one there. Okay. And this bonds to the oxygen, and so does this one. Right? And then this bonds to an oxygen, and so does this one. Hmm. Interesting. Look at that shape. What do you want to call that? Yeah, you're right. It's linear, isn't it? It's a nice straight line. These double bonds act as if they're one pair. And so do these over here. So what I like to think is whenever I have multiple bonds, I like to think of them just as one pair of electrons, one region of electron density. I know there's two pairs here, but I like to count that as one region of electron density. And this is one region. So I think of two balloons. How far are they going to be from each other? How far will two pairs be from each other? And that is 180 degrees. Okay. Now we have a dipole going to the right. Dipole going to the left, same atom, they're going to cancel each other out, so we would say that that's nonpolar. Isn't that interesting? Carbon dioxide, two double bonds, and that is nonpolar. So whenever you have multiple bonds, think of them as just being one pair of electrons. I know there are two pair there, but just think of them as being one pair when you determine shape, bond angle, and nonpolarity. In fact, I think I mentioned that up here. What is the shape and polarity of this molecule? The Vesper model works if we assume that multiple bonds act as a single pair. Um, and I made the model for you already. All right, well, let's try sulfur dioxide, SO2. Sulfur has six. Each oxygen has six. So we have 18 valence, don't we? So put sulfur here, and you know we'll try our single bonds. And this oxygen needs three more pair around it. The sulfur needs two more pair to complete its octet. And this oxygen needs three more pair. So let's see if that works. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. We're only allowed 18. That doesn't work. So we are going to try a single bond, a double bond on one side and a single on the other. Now this oxygen needs two more pairs to complete its octet. Sulfur only needs one. And this oxygen needs three pairs. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Okay, that's our beast. All right, so SO2 would appear as though it has one double and one single bond. So maybe I could build that guy for you. So we're going to go ahead and it takes a little bit of work here. But I think I'll do it for you. We have something like this. Almost done with a lone pair or non-bonding pair above the sulfur. Ugh, come on, get in there. All right, how does that look? Yeah, the shape is going to be bent. All right, if we treat this as one pair, we'd have one region of electron density, two and three, so we'd have a nice bent molecule. Now, here's something interesting about this molecule. A double bond between two atoms is always shorter than a single bond. So this double bond, we would expect to be shorter than that single bond. Um, what would you expect to see if you saw the SO2 molecule? Well, you'd expect to see this oxygen closer to the sulfur than this oxygen, wouldn't you? Actual experiments have shown that the bond length is equal. In fact, the bond length ends up being a little bit longer than a double bond, but a little bit shorter than a single bond. But the bond length between the two atoms is actually equal. So, instead of seeing one single and one double bond, there are actually two bond and a half. It looks like this. So we have a double bond over here to that oxygen and a single bond over here, right? So we'll draw that Lewis structure just like the one we have on the top. But if that double bond is shared in both positions, I'm going to draw what we call a resonance structure. I'm going to put it over here on this side. We end up with two bond and a half. Oops, there we go. I have enough electrons. There's still a pair above my sulfur. So we call these resonance structures because that double bond is shared in both positions. And the only way we can show that is by drawing the Lewis structure twice. Once in this side and once on the other side. So the shape, just like we predicted, is bent. You can see the dipoles won't cancel. So that bad boy is polar. How about the bond angle?
If we have three regions of electron density, some kids will say, oh, that's 109.5. No, think about it. If we have three regions of electron density, and they're as far away from each other as possible, they turn out being 120 degrees. It's like taking a pie and cutting it into thirds, 120 degrees. Now, some of you sharp kids are saying, wait a minute, Hummer, there's a non-bonding pair up there. That's going to reduce that, and you're right. It's actually 118 degrees. So good for you if you came up with that without me telling you. So once again, if we have multiple bonds, we treat them as if they're one pair. And remember, electron pairs want to be as far away from each other as possible. So three pair are going to be 120 degrees. Remember, four pair are going to be 109.5. If we have Lewis structures where it appears that there's one double and one single, in reality, that second bond is shared in both positions. We draw the Lewis structure twice, and we call that a resonance structure. Okay? That should do for now. We'll do a few more of these next time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.